Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And I'm really excited for today's guest of multiple real estate income streams. But before we talk to our guest, I'd be remiss until if I didn't properly introduce my co-host, you know him, you love him, Six Sigma, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And most importantly, if you're not automating your Craigslist postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Scott Todd, are you ready to have another income stream after today's podcast? Uh, I'm, I'm ready. Let's go. All right. We're going to talk to Jennifer Beatles from reimillionaire.com. Jennifer, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you guys? Uh, I'm great. I'm great. So, so Jennifer, you are, you created 22 income streams in seven years. You're a real estate investor. You're also a realtor. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. So can you kind of walk us back from the, your superhero origin story and kind of how you got started and like, and then you woke up one day and you're like, you know what? I want another income stream. Oh, you know what? Oh, another income stream. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I really got started, um, in real estate when I turned 21. And I was one of those, uh, I guess, overachievers when I was younger. I always had two jobs. Um, I was always the friend that had, you know, more money than everyone else. So, uh, so yeah, I, I really kind of became obsessed with this um, idea that I could, you know, work two jobs and, you know, create as much income as I wanted, really kind of for the freedom aspect. But then I realized that uh, we only have 24 hours in the day and you can only ever work so much. So I, I, I was working those two jobs in order to be able to buy my first house. So I did that. And the goal in buying that first house was to turn it into an investment property, which was a great idea, except that that was 2007. And uh, so, so that property didn't necessarily work out, but I really kind of continued this journey on uh, you, you know, with real estate investing and my focus, you know, after that first property was in buying cash flowing properties. And um, so, yeah, so over the years, I've really just kind of built up my portfolio, mostly focused on value add properties, which is basically the ugly stuff that no one else wanted to touch. And, um, and yeah, along the way, I've helped other investors. I've earned an income stream by being an agent who focuses on working with investors. So I was able to kind of earn as I learned as well on that. And most recently, um, I'm, I've added some more passive income streams by doing some hard money lending. And then um, I also just recently, it's not an income stream, it's more of a asset allocation, I guess, but I've done some uh, cryptocurrency investing as well. Wow. <laughs> Scott Todd. I, I'm smiling because cryptocurrency, man, I, I, <laughs> um, I paid a guy to go out and take pictures for me, Mark. Last year, a year ago, I paid him $400 in Bitcoin. Uh, it basically at the time equated to like one Bitcoin. So I'm looking back thinking I paid $4,000 for these pictures, but <laughs> I mean, you know, J Jennifer, like when, when you started like, uh, okay, so y you know, you're working multiple jobs and, uh, like, you know, you, you had to have started with connections, right? Like, I mean, because geez, you know, no, no one starts off and, and just achieve success like you did. So I, I'm, 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 I'm saying that like jokingly because, you know, you probably didn't have the connections that you wanted to. So how did you build the connections that you needed in order to be successful? Because I'm sure you're not like, you weren't loaded with money at the time that you started, right? Oh gosh, no, no. So, um, so I bought that first house and I started to, um, kind of learn how to remodel it. It was a, a built in 1901, which is pretty old for our area for, you know, Washington state. Um, so it was actually one of the oldest houses in that city, but, um, but anyway, so I was remodeling this house, you know, still working the two jobs and I decided, um, that I really wanted to go all in on real estate. And so the first thing, um, you know, I was not thinking about getting into sales at all, um, on the, you know, agent side. Um, so I actually got hired with a builder and I learned about land development. Um, I basically, 
kind of went in and, you know, was working as a project manager, um, helped do a lot of the budgeting and kind of the oversight, permitting, site plans, um, you know, really everything to do with, you know, building houses. And uh, one thing that I noticed that the owners were doing, which was really smart, is they would go and build a couple houses, take some of the profits, and then they would go and build a duplex. And so we would, you know, kind of repeat this process of we'd sell a couple houses and then we'd go ahead and build, you know, a duplex for the um, owners to keep. And that was something that really kind of stuck with me is this idea that, you know, you can have whatever business you have, you know, in this case, of course, it was, you know, um, building houses and selling them and then taking, you know, a percentage of that profit and, you know, adding in these additional income streams, which, you know, in their case was in the form of rentals. So my connections really came from the building and development side. Um, so shortly thereafter, um, I decided to get my real estate license so that I could use my agent commission um, as a down payment to buy another property to owner occupy. So um, I went ahead and did that and, you know, bought a duplex where I owner occupied, lived in one side and then had the, you know, the rent offset that mortgage. So I learned so much by working in that, you know, development side that, um, that, that really kind of catapulted me into this whole, you know, opening my eyes of, um, you know, how it goes into land development and rental properties and how financing works and, you know, getting an idea of the costs of everything, how to, you know, run budgets, how to rehab properties. Um, and that really, that was really my connection, I guess, if you will, of how all of that, of how all that works. So where did you get your original capital? Where, where did that come from? Um, hustling, working. <laughs> no, I just, uh. I say, you know, I think, I think as a younger person, sometimes the challenge is, you know, when you've earned the money, the, the natural idea is to then go and spend it somewhere. But if you don't have a good place to spend it, then we just find ourselves spending it on, you know, entertainment or, you know, clothes, you know, whatever trips. And in this case, after I um, kind of got into real estate, I was like, great, I'm just going to spend all my money on real estate. So, um, so yeah, I just, I saved my money. Um, that was my idea was, you know, I'm going to save as much as I can and, you know, put it towards building a rental portfolio that would then, you know, pay me to own it. I mean, Jennifer, you're kind of, you're kind of different for, you know, from like most people in the sense that you really kind of caught on very young about the, the compound power of, of money and multiple income streams and kind of, you know, taking this sort of a uh, different view of money is not something to provide me pleasure, you know, momentarily, momentary pleasure, but something that's going to provide me security for the long run, real wealth, and then I'll be able to do whatever I want, um, whenever I want. Uh, what did your parents do and, and where did you get this sort of philosophy? Yeah, so my parents were small business owners and um, so was my uh, grandparents, so I've really been kind of exposed to this idea that, you know, you can really have as much freedom as you want if you're willing to work for it. <laughs> and, uh, and my parents worked really hard. My dad was actually a wildlife photographer and still is. And, um, and so, you know, as kids, I, I got to, uh, we, we would set up in these little art festivals and sell my dad's pictures. And so I had the ability to work the cash register and kind of, you know, see how that side of things went. Um, and, and I think I also learned a lot about, you know, that was my parents' sole source of income. And they actually did really, really, really well. But I also noticed that, you know, if they wanted to take time off or if they didn't want to work as hard, um, you know, they were, they were kind of stuck in that, um, you know, I guess self-employment, if you will, <laughs> if you talk about, you know, Robert Kiyosaki and the difference between, you know, investor, business owner, self-employed, employed, um, they had great job security being self-employed. And, and again, I learned so many lessons from them early on. And then I also learned that um, if I wanted to really, 
kind of have a different lifestyle, then it would be about, yes, absolutely working hard, but then building in those passive income streams kind of behind me uh, to make sure that I didn't have to, you know, work 30 years hard, right? So yeah, they, I mean, those were, you know, invaluable lessons that I learned from them growing up for sure. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I, I love um, the private money niche. My, my buddy who, who lives out here works for a billionaire and they do private money. And uh, like the returns now, Scott and I would like laugh because we make like 300 to a thousand percent, but you know, in the real world, like he's averaging like 12, 13% on, on private money. Um, and you know, able to deploy, you know, $500 million to do that. Uh, of all the income streams, how would you rank them? Like which ones you like the most to which ones you like the least and why? That's a tough question. So, <laughs> Answer it any way you want. Scott's like, Mark, why are you giving her this question? <laughs> you know, um, gosh, you know, it's really hard because I think the rental properties, um, they're probably my favorite. They're definitely um, the most amount, I shouldn't say the most amount of time because, right, I mean, my, um, my agent commission income side of things, that's still pretty active. Um, but, you know, I think with the rentals, having the ability to be a good um, you know, good at acquisitions and then being a good operator in the sense that, you know, I'm able to buy properties, go in there, do, um, a, you know, pretty quick, inexpensive rehab, and then get new tenants in there that will pay, you know, a much higher um, rental amount, at which point I've now increased the income. And then as a byproduct of increasing the income, I've increased the value. So, I think having an income tied to an actual asset um, is a huge value. And I don't get that with the hard money. I mean, when, once the loan gets paid off, then that income stream is gone. I have to go find another one. Whereas, um, you know, with these rental properties, the income streams just go up over time and the value of the asset also goes up over time. So I think that that's something that's really unique to um, rental properties that, um, that most people I think should really consider is the fact that yes, there's an income stream, but there's also an asset that's attached to it. So that was my favorite. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I, I do, I do like the fact that, you know, one of the things about, uh, rental income is the fact that you own an asset and then you're just renting it off, right? Like the, that income stream does not go away. You know, Mark, one of the, one of the things that, um, that, I mean, in a way it's kind of, it's kind of funny how you play it, right? Like, you know, like for us, for you and I, when, when we sell a piece of land, we, we still own that asset and the person's basically essentially renting it from us. And there's a lot of times where they just don't pay it off, right? They, they just, they just leave and whatever it becomes that perpetual money machine. And then, you know, when you get that one that pays off, you're like, ah, oh, darn it. <laughs> you know, uh, however, you know, I know that a lot of people are really focused on in the early days of building their passive income. And so they want, they want those notes to get paid. And for me, I'm like, eh, you know, it's okay because I know where it's going to lead to. And I not necessarily depend on that cash flow today versus, you know, we're, we're just going to keep it going. So I, I do like the fact that, that you have an asset that you're renting out and then that, that, that asset increases in value over time. Plus you're getting cash flow today. Um, you know, and, and some of the other, other aspects that go along with that, like depreciation, et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, but I, I would say that our advantage is that, yeah, we don't own the physical asset, but we also don't own the headache of the physical asset. So, you know, Jennifer might be going to call at three in the morning, the, the roof is leaking um, where nobody calls us and says, Hey, the, the dirt is, turning brown. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, you know, you know, what's great about it though, is that, um, is the fact that it's, it's funny because, um, I don't feel any, like any pressure to like do what Jennifer's doing, which is like, I've got to then go in and rehab the place or fix it up. Or, you know, I've, I've got extra cash I got to deploy. And honestly, I can, I, and I'm not, I'm not slamming Jennifer. I'm just saying like what I like about what I like about what we do here is I like the fact that I can deploy. I don't need a lot of money to deploy, right? Like I don't need a bank to say yay or nay. I don't have to go get hard money to, to go do what we're going to do. 
Uh, and so it's like, I can turn the money faster as, and, and I can do more deal flow than someone who's got to now get involved with financing and building, building investors or building partners or going to get hard money loans and having all that tied back in, you know, like we, we can just, we're, we're like, we're like uh, nimble. We're like, like yogis, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jennifer, do you ever watch these HGTV shows and DIY network shows and just roll your eyes? Oh, what absolutely. Do you, what, what do you, what, what's the real, what really happens? What's going on in those reality shows? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think the the biggest thing is, you know, it seems like they make it sound so, you know, easy and simple. And and one of the, I think the biggest thing today is, you know, actually my husband and I were just chatting about that last night is how much things have changed in just a few short years. I mean, I remember, you know, back in the days when we were building a lot of houses that contractors were, you know, begging me for work. And, you know, they were, they were, you know, reducing their prices. Um, you know, they were knocking on my door. They were bringing me, you know, cards and gift cards and things. And today it's like, you know, I, I was looking for an electrician the other day. And I think I probably called 15, like literally, kid you not, 15 different companies. And all of them kind of laughed and they're like, oh, this is service work. Well, call us when you're building another duplex. We'll look at that. And so the, I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, on these shows, they make it sound like, oh, they've got their crews that come in and everyone shows up and everything, you know, goes for the most part pretty well. And that's just not the case, at least not in the Seattle market uh, for a lot of, you know, other markets of, you know, friends that I, that I have that, you know, invest in. Um, you know, right now we have a huge shortage of contractors and, you know, it's kind of like pulling teeth, getting anyone to show up and, you know, help do the work. So uh, I think to your point that yes, you know, going in and rehabbing these properties, um, we have to get pretty darn creative. Um, my husband this morning is installing new laminate floors <laughs> in one of our rentals. Um, granted, he was able to retire at 30 years old from our rental income, but uh, he is now <laughs> our flooring install guy. He's our painter. He's our, you know, does a lot of the work because it's just really hard to find people that will, you know, come out, show up and do the work. Mark, I mean, like, do, do you feel like, and, and Jennifer, maybe you, you know, you, you have this thought too, but like, you're talking about like the shortage of contractors and the fact that people just aren't, aren't like willing to jump at the work. Is that a, is that a sign that like uh, the economy is so great and like the markets are like near their top? Because you know what I see a lot right now is I'm starting to see a lot of bandit signs that say we buy houses, right? Like it, it's like reminiscent of like, I don't know, 2006, maybe 2005 where people are like starting to get into the hunt again. And it seems like they always start to get in the hunt too late, right? Like, you know, it, in terms of in terms of, um, you know, residential or rentals is, I mean, fix and flips, do you feel like it's like, is there still opportunity or are you, are you seeing prices just ridiculous? Yeah, I think that there's opportunity in any market. And then no matter what the market's doing, I think the difference is finding opportunities that others may have passed up for any given reason, or of course, off market opportunities. Um, I am seeing, more and more investors enter the marketplace than I ever have in my entire, you know, career. Um, I definitely am feeling some uh, re reminders of 2007. And, and honestly, you know, I'm a little concerned. Um, I'm, and we're kind of seeing that across the board, really. Um, I had a, a private equity deal pitch about two weeks ago, and it was just, it was entertaining. You know, these guys had a $5 million valuation on a company that, brought in $30,000 in revenue in last quarter. And, and, and it was like, you know, and, and, and granted, I'm not a, um, you know. That, that used to be my world. I used to do, do investment banking with private equity groups. That oh. doesn't, those numbers don't sound right, Jennifer. Yeah, well, um, needless to say, I didn't do that deal. But, uh, but you know, and, and honestly, I asked them how, you know, this is just, of course, an example of the marketplace that we're in, right? Across not just real estate, but, you know, stock market, all these different things is um, everyone's looking for yield right now. And everyone seems to be going um, in directions that maybe they shouldn't be. And, you know, of course, real estate's included in that. And um, so, you know, it's, it's concerning, though, at the same time, you know, investors ask me all the time, well, should I wait it out? Should I wait for the next recession? Should I wait to do something until everything cools off. And honestly, my advice is 
well, it doesn't necessarily, you're not going to gain anything by waiting, though I would definitely be cautious and very careful in today's marketplace. Um, the rental properties that I've bought this year um, have increased my, um, you know, net income by, I think I've, I've brought in like an additional $4,000 a month um, by these rentals that in these projects that I've acquired this year, which is, and we're still in a really hot market and I'm in Seattle, which is really one of the hottest markets, you know, in the U S but it's only because I have the ability to, you know, find deals and only find projects that make sense. So yeah, I would say deals are out there. Um, but people just really need to be careful and really need to be, um, you know, strict with their criteria. All right. So one more question before we get to the tip of the week, what is the best or most worthwhile investment you've ever made? And it can be an investment of, Money, time, energy, or otherwise? Um, so I would actually say buying that very first house, which was a terrible investment. I didn't actually um, lose any money, but it was, I mean, I, you know, I bought the house for uh, 218 and I think within 18 months it went down to maybe 140 right? So it was a terrible investment. But I think making that terrible investment gave me, the insight gave me the lessons, um, really got me started in real estate. So uh, had I not, you know, had that experience, had, had the market continued to even increase at that point, um, I probably would have been in a really tough position, you know, acquiring more properties that, you know, weren't cash flowing, potentially going to go underwater. Um, so I think just m taking that action step and just making a decision and saying, I'm going to do this. Of course, it was a bad decision, <laughs> but just taking, taking action, making that decision and making something happen um, is, was definitely the best deal, deal of a lifetime. Yeah, I always think action trumps inaction, even if it's imperfect action. Scott Todd loves saying, always be moving your feet. Scott, is that, is that yeah, still yeah, the like cliche? Don't, yeah, don't stop, man. Like, I don't care what, what you get slammed with, just like how fast can you like get off the ropes and, and get back into the boxing match, right? Like, you know, don't, don't be like McGregor and just rest on the ropes, right? Like, you know, keep swinging at all costs. And, uh, you know, I don't know, even McGregor laid on the ropes and got 20 million. So I don't mind, don't mind <laughs> I think judge, he got right? Seven, he got 70 million. Yeah. yeah, Scott, I mean, the, the rumor is he bought Ireland. Like he just bought the country. I, I didn't. I didn't hear that he he had seventy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Um, so Jennifer, we're at that point in the podcast now. We're going to put you on the spot, ask you for your tip of the week. Your mentorship has been phenomenal, but we want one more tip: a website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? Yeah, so I want to actually, since we're on the topic of, you know, hot markets and, you know, things like that, I want everyone to go back, even if you watched it before, but rewatch The Big Short. The Big Short, and actually Too Big to Fail, is also a phenomenal movie. Um, and you might start seeing some things that are currently happening in the market, uh, <laughs> but I think that movie is a phenomenal reminder. So, action or your My Tip of the Week is go watch if for the first either for the first time or rewatch the big short i love the big short and i and i read the book too but the big short the 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 movie is, is really just as good as the book scott have you what's the last time you watched the big short i watched it like last month uh it's been a few months it's i don't know six months or so yeah it, it really makes you so just sort of you know dis in what, what's the word this disenchanted or with like our system like the system is corrupt basically like no one's out there looking after you um it's it's insanity and uh i don't know jennifer what, what was the the what did you get out of that movie well you know i think the biggest thing is people don't understand how mortgages work how really i think wall street works and I think, um, you know, I've always tried to explain it to people. And so finally I had a movie and I just said, hey, just go watch the movie. Um, and that's something, you know, I, I make it a point to go learn about what I'm investing in. 
um, you know, even specifically on land, right? I mean, before I, before I buy any land, I'm going to go and, you know, read the code, get an idea of, you know, what's allowed in that zoning, really, you know, understand what I'm getting into. And, um, and so I, I think, yeah, there's a lot of people that they sign on the dotted line for these mortgages, but they have no idea, you know, how it works. Um, they have no idea, you know, really what they're getting into. So I think that that's probably the, the best is just the foundational piece of understanding how, you know, mortgage-backed securities work, how even that the last um, recession cr was created and, and really, you know, how that all works. So I think just, yeah, the understanding the fundamentals is, is the most important. I love it. I love it. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Um, Mark, check out this website. It's uh, dreamypixel.com. Dreamypixel.com. A website and I have not heard of. Basically, you know, if you enter in your email address through their like lead magnet, you're going to get access to like a boatload of like beautiful free landscape images uh, that you can use. You can use in your deals of the week, your ads. Okay. They may not be exactly for the properties, but I mean, maybe you need it for your website. I don't know. Maybe you, you just need a, a beautiful picture. There you go. I just I love brought it. you freedom. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. It's a gift. This is great. Mountains. I mean, this is really good. Yeah. This is perfect. Yeah. I just, I just subscribed. But it's not as good as my tip of the week, by the way. Uh, so, I can only imagine. I mean, not to be competitive, but my tip of the week. I actually have two tips of the week. Two tips of the week because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piggyback on what Jennifer said um, regarding the economy. One of my favorite YouTube videos is uh, it's, it's a billionaire hedge fund from Bridgewater. Bridgewater Associates is the largest hedge fund in the country. And uh, billionaire Ray Dalio created this video called How the Economic Machine Works. So if you go on YouTube and just search How the Economic Machine Works, you can watch it or you can just Google it. Um, it it's, so, it's so simple the way he describes how the economic machine works. Like my, I make my children watch it. Um, phenomenal video. But my final tip of the week is learn more about Jennifer and her 1.2 million income streams <laughs> at reimillionaire.com. reimillionaire.com. Tons of information in there um, and experiments and passive income resources. She's got courses. It's, it's a plethora of knowledge and information. So Jennifer Beatles, are we good? Yeah. Yep. I think we covered a lot of different topics. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot to talk about within real estate and I love what you guys are doing with land. You know, that, that was really kind of my point of reaching out is, you know, very few people talk about the options with land. Of course, you know, my goal is to always build on it <laughs> and build, uh, you know, small multifamilies and, you know, stick tenants in there and get myself income streams, you know, on that way. But, uh, but yeah, I love what you guys are doing. So keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Todd, are we good? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're I good. Just, we're good. All right. I just want to remind the listeners the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Jennifer Beatles from reimillionaire.com is if you do us three little tiny favors, it takes you five seconds. You got to go to iTunes. You got to subscribe. You got to rate and you got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of your review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit. So please do that. I just want to remind everybody today's podcast is sponsored by geekpay.io, the only set it and forget it. Financial CRM automates everything. Geekpay.io. All right. Well, let freedom ring. Ring. All right. Thanks everybody. Thanks listeners. And uh, we'll see you geeky people ladders. Thanks.